Yes. Okay. And good evening to everybody who is live streaming this at home. Uh, again, this is uh, Maine Animal Central School District Budget Workshop number four. Uh, a budget workshop is a workshop, a work session for the Board of Education. Uh, if you have questions, there will be an opportunity to ask later um, during uh, the general board meeting, the regular board meeting. But for purposes of a budget workshop, it is a work session for the Board of Education. Tonight in attendance are the Board of Education, uh, myself, Jason Van Fossen, our Assistant Superintendent, Jeff Lamoureux, and our Board of Education Clerk, Michelle Andrews. Also in attendance tonight is Tom Gillen, who is providing technical support um, for our virtual meeting. Uh, I will quickly go through the next couple slides. They're just information for the public. I know board members, you have all seen this numerous times. Uh, this is our board shop uh, schedule that we have had for the last uh, probably two months. It's been set up, but please everyone on the board know uh, that the next two dates in uh, TAN, we were scheduled to have a board adoption, uh, excuse me, a budget adoption on April 20th with the change from the executive order pushing the budget vote uh, out past June. That will change, date to be determined. And also the budget vote will have to, a new date will have to be determined. Um, I do not have a lot of information on that uh, other than uh, some conversation that was shared to us today by the district superintendent, Al Bike uh, of BT BOCES, who said there is a possibility of absentee voting um, instead of having in-person voting. So when and if a budget vote uh, does occur, it will be after June, and there is a possibility it will be completely all absentee ballot. So um, just a little bit of information. We will be adopting our budget, however, uh, obviously prior to that. So at the earliest, it could be May 7th, which is our next board meeting after, after April 20th, and that will be our tentative target date. So just for purposes of planning and, and uh, you know, where we need to be, uh, May 7th would be our, our new expected budget adoption, but I will put that information out later when, when we know more information. And then same thing here, just our topics. And tonight we're just going to review our, our third draft. I want to thank Cynthia Wombold. Cynthia is on the panel tonight. Uh, Cynthia will be providing support uh, and, and uh, answering any questions you have from the Central Business Office regarding budget development. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. So as we have now uh, reviewed multiple times, but for anyone who's new uh, on the live stream, uh, when we build our budgets, we, we use three principles. Uh, first, we want to deliver a premier education to all students that our community can and will uh, can afford and will support. We want to provide a well-rounded uh, K-12 educational program and we need to make sure that the district uh, is financially healthy and sustainable. So when we build budgets, this, these are the three guiding principles that we utilize uh, to, to start with. On January 23rd for our first budget workshop, I know Board of Education members, you've seen this, so I will, I will go through quickly. Uh, we started this current year, or we, we started the budget development for 2021 with a slight deficit of our current school year, 1920, based on some uh, unexpected special ed costs and alternative education costs. Uh, we are addressing this current deficit through uh, fund balance. And there is the possibility it could come down slightly uh, because of expenses not occurring at the same rate because of school not being in session. However, at this point, we really can't factor that in because uh, we still have two months of school left. But uh, it is a possibility that that number could, could drop a little bit. We also presented on the 23rd that uh, based on the current projection of expenditures exceeding revenue, uh, that we are heading into a uh, structural deficit, and that decisions this year are necessary to address a structural deficit. 
And again, a structural deficit is when your expenditures exceed revenue and are projected to exceed revenue year after year, which is what you're seeing, obviously, tonight. So this was what we started the budget development season on, needing to address this deficit. And many people ask, so why do you have a deficit? Uh, as we have projected over the last probably five years now, if you go back to 2015, uh, health insurance costs, special education costs, and retirement costs have been the largest drivers. Uh, retirement costs less than the other two have been the largest drivers uh, in our costs uh, equation. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, our revenue side of the equation, the tax levy and the state aid, uh, is out of our control. So as you'll see later, a 97% of every, 97 cents of every dollar that the district receives comes from those two uh, areas, tax levy, local tax share, and state aid. So when revenues uh, do not keep pace with expenditures, you have what's called a structural deficit, and you have to address it. So tonight, Here's our updated information, and obviously for Board of Ed members, just let us know when you have questions, uh, and, and please jump in whenever. So we've tried to put together a list of variables. We started last week. Obviously, the, the COVID-19 uh, has had a huge impact, but even going back before that, uh, state aid represents 49 cents of every dollar we receive. The COVID-19 pandemic has impacted the state financially, and in, and in response, state aid is now going to be impacted for 2021. And I'll talk a little bit about that um, a little later, uh, and Cynthia can certainly a answer any questions as well. Three and four, though, are the areas we've been identifying and we are struggling to contain. Health insurance costs are growing and they're growing based on known claims. And what a known claim is, you know someone has a condition and you know that that expense is going to continue. Special ed costs uh, are continuing to grow based on student enrollment. So it's students who are already here. Uh, what makes that difficult is that students uh, register year round and when a student registers and they have significant needs and they have an IEP, we are bound to obviously support that. Uh, number five and six, we talked, we've talked about the last couple budget workshops, but we are at a point where uh, some further conversation, uh, I believe, is warranted. Our tax levy limit, which represents 46 cents of every dollar that we receive, uh, has simply not kept pace with our expenditures, and you'll see that later on. And then when you look back uh, over the last nine years, we've made reductions to expenditures in 12, 13, 13, 14, 18, 19, and now 2021. And when people ask, why are you continuing to make reductions, uh, they were necessary and continue to be necessary to not only have a reserve and fund balance, but also to just simply offset these large increases that we've seen in special education and health insurance. So um, in order to stay healthy, we have had to make our expenditures line up with our revenues, and unfortunately revenues have not kept pace with where our expenditures are. So that's the, the, those are the variables that we have been dealt with uh, over the last several years, but this year in particular, it's taking on a new, um, I guess a new look with the COVID-19 pandemic. So as the board knows and the public, if you are new, if this is your first budget workshop, we have utilized the following strategies to reduce the deficit. Um, number one, we are attempting to not fill open positions, and those are those coming from retirements or resignations. And I will just simply put an asterisk there that there are positions within the district that regardless of the desire to not fill them, you have to. Uh, either because of requirements or student safety. Um, for example, school nurse, you cannot go, uh, you cannot not have a school nurse in a school building. Um, and that would be a prime example of a position that you would obviously have to fill. So uh, our goal is to not fill open positions to reduce the, the need to lay people off if we have to. Number two, reductions to staffing across all areas, including instructional and non-instructional and non-instructional. Reducing budget lines based off of historical averages, and you'll see that in more detail, and then reducing contracted services. So these four areas are where we have attempted or are attempting to uh, reduce our expenditures. 
So this is as of April 9th, 2020. Um, what you should know is that budget to budget, it's a $1.5 million uh, increase from the year before, but we've worked very hard to try to contain that number. And so where you look where it says increased budget to budget, where you see it in parentheses, that is where we have reduced spending in those areas from the year before. If you notice uh, the $1 million increase in BOCES, that is primarily about 950000 of that is special education costs. So I just wanted to, uh, to note that, that when you're asking where's the special education costs, they're in BOCES. And like I said, about 950 of that million dollar uh, is coming, is from there. Now, on March 26, we presented the use of reserves, and I highlighted reserves. This is our revenue picture. So we have state aid uh, of 24.8, other revenue 1.2, state aid, I'm sorry, tax levy of 24.8, other revenue 1.2, state aid of 27.5, appropriated fund balance of 250, and then appropriated reserve use of 1.1. And so what you're going to see changed on tonight is the state aid number, which we've had a reduction based on COVID-19 and state aid being impacted and the state economy being impacted. We also, you're going to see a reduction in the reserve use, and we'll explain the, the rationale for that. So I want to focus just on reserves. If you look at our reserve use, so projected 63020 reserves, and then if you look at the top where it says proposed on 3-6, this was our proposed use of reserves on March 26, $1.1 million. So after our state aid numbers came in, and you'll see this in the, in the next slide, we recognized that we had less state aid and we still had a heavy reliance on reserves. And so our proposal tonight will be to reduce the reserve use by over a half million dollars to compensate for the loss of state aid and the, law and the overuse of reserves, knowing that we have to have some sort of financial cushion in the event mid-year reductions or mid-year state aid cuts happen. And right now, and Cynthia, please join me, uh, you know, join in. I know you've talked to various groups and you're, you know, on a lot of uh, phone calls and a lot of meetings. The likelihood of state aid reductions is 50-50 right now. Is that fair? I haven't heard any percentages, but I think that everyone's very realistic that there's a very real chance for mid-year reductions. And unfortunately, um, we, we know that there's, there's no way to tell what they would be by district at this point. So when you, when you look at the next column over, uh, the 533, is now available for mid-year cuts in the event we need to plug uh, state aid reductions with, with revenue. So again, moving forward, if you take what we presented on March 26th with what we're presenting and proposing on April 9th, you'll know a significant reduction in reserve use uh, of, of almost, oh, well, over half a million dollars for that purpose to have money in the event state aid is reduced. Also, if you'll note at the top uh, state aid, we were projected to get 27.5. You'll note now we are projected to get 27.3, so there is a slight reduction. Um, and I say slight, a reduction is a reduction. There's a reduction in state aid. Um, and it could be further uh, next year. So I just want to stop there for board uh, for the board. If there's questions before we move on, um, that was that's the first major change from March 26th. Is we believe we need to have some some savings uh, in the event there's a mid-year reduction. Okay. Then I, let me move on. So the strategies to reduce uh, our expenditures are such, and I'm going to go through each of the areas. Um, we have identified, and first let me back up. Last board meeting, March 26th, we presented uh, several options, 
and they had specific positions identified. And they were positions that had been uh, discussed as potential. They weren't decisions, they were just potential options. Uh, as we moved closer, as we moved closer to making a final recommendation to you, um, we are not comfortable putting up particular positions because the, the, the closer we get to making a final decision, um, I don't believe it's appropriate for people to see those positions on a PowerPoint prior to having had a conversation with them. So in fairness to people who may be impacted, uh, we are not going to put up uh, particular uh, positions until the budget is up for adoption. And when the budget is up for adoption, people will have already been notified of these decisions so that it's not a surprise or that it's at least uh, it's not public for the first time. So I just want to be very clear on that. But as of today, we've identified 19.4 positions that, um, you know, we, we need to make uh, reductions in in order to, to meet our gap. Um, the point four, people sometimes say a point four, there is a part-time position that would be eliminated, so that's what the point four represents. But you'll know we've identified about 1.1, uh, almost 1.1 yeah, uh, million dollars in reductions through uh, salary. We've also identified a number of other non-salary items and how to read this uh, for for the board uh, different from last time. Everything in blue was presented to you on March 26th. Everything in like, uh, I guess it's like a green teal color, uh, starting with climate survey, would be uh, additional items that we have added since then. Now, I wanna just note a couple items on here, um, and certainly I'll answer any questions for any of them that you have, but. Uh, the, the ones that have BOCES COSER next to them, so strategic planning through technology purchases, those are items that we receive state aid on. However, um, we you know, recognize that we need to make reductions and despite the net uh, uh, savings being less because of the BOCES aid you receive, we still feel uh, these reductions are appropriate. When you start with budget requests, these are items that we have reduced on all of our requests that we receive in November and December from staff. And so we have made, again, about 66, almost $67,000 worth of reductions from those requests. And I wanna know, uh, Mr. Armazani, you had asked about the Board of Education budget being reduced. We did include those reductions that you had suggested um, and those are in there uh, as well. They're part of that 66,000. Thank you. The, uh, the other items, again, uh, and I think Jeff had mentioned our air temp service contract. Uh, we we're looking to make reductions there. That's for uh, preventative maintenance and over, uh, you know, the, uh, maintaining our uh, HVAC equipment. Uh, standard equipment, just a $10,000 reduction in equipment. Uh, stipends, uh, lead teachers in particular, um, that would be one area that we would uh, reduce. That's not a complete reduction of lead teachers. It's a reduction of some. Uh, Dave Cook, our athletic director, has identified uh, three teams, two modified teams and another varsity level team, indoor track, uh, that uh, he has uh, presented as potential reductions. We are eliminating conferences. Uh, we are reducing extra hours and overtime. And you're going to see that twice. And the reason for that is we identified some savings back in uh, mid-March. And we were identified, we're going even deeper, I guess is the best way to say that, in April. So for overtime and extra hours, we would be shaving $75,000. Uh, historically, we spend around $285,000. And so $75,000 uh, is a significant reduction. Um, however, that to us is an area that we can, we can control and we're just going to have to, you know, we're just going to have to live with them and that will, you know, th there will be some, uh, some unfortunate services that may not be uh, uh, done as a result of that. But that's an area that we felt we could, we could certainly reduce. Um, the climate survey, I, I had mentioned before, there are federal requirements to have a, to have a climate survey for your parents and students. Uh, <laughs> however, um, we're gonna add that to this list and know that that could come off depending on that requirement. Or we could do something far 
you know, far less than, than what we currently have. Uh, copy printing reductions of 25,000. Uh, we spend about 120,000 on copying and printing. So a $25,000 reduction is a significant reduction. Although that's an area we too think, um, you know, we can see savings and, and have to. The additional instructional position. So what this position is going to be is we've identified 19.4, but we also recognize that um, we may need to go to 20.4. And using the strategies that I've mentioned earlier, if there are positions that we do not need to fill, then we will, we will not fill them. And so that is a position that we have not identified uh, yet, but it's a position that we're building in because we recognize uh, we may have to do it under the circumstances. And then additional professional development. So we've already reduced professional development in the summer for 25,000. We're reducing that another 12. And that's pretty much knock, knocking us down to zero professional development, um, which I'll, I'll caveat with, you bring new people on or people join the organization, you have to train them. You can't simply let them flounder. Um, but by reducing that by that amount, um, you know, we're going to have significantly less ability to do that. So that's going to be a, a legitimate consequence. And then some additional stipend positions that we will reduce. We have not identified specifics um, that, we're with, that I'm ready to present. I will, uh, but about $10,000 more. So that's about $50,000 in stipends that we have identified that will be reduced for a total of $582,700. So when you combine that with the instructional uh, savings, you get our, our uh, total uh, savings that we are uh, presenting. Any questions on that before we move forward? So, Jason, would the, um, the professional development, would that include like guest speakers and people we bring in and pay for um, facilitating and, and whatever? You know? Yes, it could. I mean, yeah. you know, it's, 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 it's nice to have those things, but, you know, in this, in this uh, environment, you know, I think uh, no stone, <laughs> I said it before, right? No stone needs to be unturned that, that can uh, save a position. So, correct. Okay. Thanks. Yep. So the remaining questions, and this is where for tonight, um, you know, where we need some guidance and, and we obviously we're, we're coming in on the, the need to adopt a budget uh, in these crazy times. But these are the three questions that in our opinion still remain, you know, is there going to be mid-year reductions, which is why we are, uh, you know, trying to eliminate uh, such a heavy use on reserves. Is there, are there additional areas that we can seek savings from? And, and there may have to be, and that's why we, we are uh, uncovering every stone and looking um, and knowing that there's going to be some, some pain. Uh, you, you cannot make $1.7 million in reductions and not expect to have a program up, uh, uh, disrupted or people upset or opportunities uh, taken away from students. It's, uh, it's impossible not to. So, you know, that is just uh, something that we are obviously having to come to grips with. And then the third part, and I had mentioned to you last time, you know, on March 12th, before the pandemic, we were ready to ask the community to override the tax levy. And then last time we met on the 26th, uh, we kind of backed off of that and said, geez, you know what, I think we just need to stay at the tax levy. But in thinking about what we are giving up, and then if you recall, we did some, uh, and I will, I will come back to those, we did a, the exercise on how much money uh, we've cumulatively lost from not seeking all of the tax levy in 2012, uh, and how much money that ended up being over nine years, and you realize it comes back to if the community uh, wants to see us provide uh, the education that we currently provide, we do not have enough revenue to do that. And so if we, if we don't ask them for more money, uh, then we have no other choice but to make the decisions we're making. Um, on the flip side, as we said last time, it feels tone deaf 
to ask people for more money when you've got such uh, uncertain uh, financial and economic times in front of us. So I don't want to be the person, the singular person that recommends that we don't seek uh, an override of the tax levy if the community thinks we should. So I really want to uh, pause for a second and ask you as a board, you know, do, do, we, do we ask the community to override uh, because of the reductions we're making, the impact it's going to have on, on, on the school district, or because of the circumstances, we just uh, we make the decision that we move on. It's not the right time to ask for an override. And that's kind of where I need uh, some guidance and help from all of you because we're struggling with that question. Um, Jason, with increasing that tax levy, would that help with um, the number of instructional reductions we need to make? Uh, depending on the amount of override, uh, yes. It won't, it won't save everything, but it would have an impact. Mm -hmm. So... That's a question that I think is extremely difficult for, you know, seven people to answer. Uh, yeah. And as you, I, I would say yes, if the circumstances weren't such as they were with the pandemic. And, if, you know, uh, obviously there's a lot of, um, people who are not working right now, okay? And, uh, um, you know, now the situation could change um, sometime next year, um, but I think that's gonna be a little while before everybody ramp, you know, before employment ramps up to a level where it was, okay? And that'll it'll definitely be outside of this current school year. The question is, how do you engage the community to understand, okay, what they're willing to support? Uh, to the level that we might need to ask them to support, I guess. All right, and what's the right time for them that they would, that they or we would know? Right. They, there's a lot of unknowns there. I just had one question, and forgive me if I'm confusing things, but I know that the that there's potential for the vote to be delayed. Is there potential for 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 the decision about the tax levy to be delayed also, or or I guess what I'm asking is, how much time could we possibly have to make that decision? Do we know that yet? Uh, you know, Cynthia, I would not, Cynthia, could you, do you have an idea on that? I don't. It's a good question. Sure. So you would need to make that decision at the time that you adopt the budget. So at this point, it could be as late, it could, you're tentatively looking at possibly May 7th to adopt the budget. It really depends on when the vote date is set by the state. Everything f come, goes backwards from that vote date, but I, I wouldn't think it would be before May 7th. Um, one thing that we are recommending is that districts wait until after the first uh, revenue recognition period for the state where they're going to analyze how the state's doing and that's um, through the end of this month, April 30th. And then we may or may not, but we may have a, an idea of uh, the first cut that may happen at that time. So that may help influence decisions. So most districts are waiting to adopt their budgets until um, after April 30th. So I think Greg made a really excellent point or, or question about how do we engage the community in the discussion? Yeah, and I, I have a, a uh, uh, an idea on that, um, actually. So I'm glad that came up. Yeah, <laughs> and is there a way that we can, um, if it's sending something out to the community, uh, letting them know what we're looking at as far as our reductions and just a questionnaire of whether or not they would be supportive in 
um, supporting a tax levy increase to help with these reductions. Or even uh, a quick online survey, just would you support uh, this yes or no, knowing that raising the tax levy could, you know, uh, impact the school district in a positive way. Um, maybe if we, you know, get, give the public a chance to, to voice their thoughts and opinions, it might help us to kind of formulate a plan. Well, yeah, and I would say, are there groups within the school district that we could engage to help us engage the community? Okay. Um, like, for instance, the Teachers Association, uh, right, or the, uh, um, you know, the Booster Club or any, right, it, it, you know, I, I know everybody's, you know, socially isolated now, but, um, you know, other, other ways to get the message out, I guess. So. Do we also have an idea of um, what would be recommended of what to raise it to? Yeah, I have some data I'll share with you. It's from uh, March 12th, but yeah, we do have some kind of ranges that we could uh, could target. I mean, I don't think that it would, I don't think that we could come up with a number that would be palatable that would avoid all of the cuts, right? Or all of the reductions, um, but certainly from a, you know, priority program standpoint, we could take a look at, uh, you know, what's, um, you know, not to sound insensitive, but what's, you know, what, what programs could we avoid impacting significantly that are important to the students? Yep. Does that make sense, what I just said? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So. Yeah, and, and uh, engaging the community is absolutely necessary, and I'm glad that's, uh, that came up. I, I want to show you, uh, so this is the data. I'll get to that, that um, uh, engagement piece because I think we have a pretty good possible plan. So this is the data that we had presented on the 12th, so anyone who was not here for the meeting, uh, back on the first year of the tax levy law, 12-13, our tax levy was 5.16. And because at the time everyone was fearful of going out over anything that was that what didn't have a two, uh, we went out at 2.49. We left 2.67 uh, uncollected. And so it doesn't seem to be a big deal in year one, but when you cumulatively add that up over the years uh, that followed, it was a significant loss of tax levy just from that one year of not collecting that money, that 2.67%. That and so when you think about that earlier slide where, where our revenue growth is at 2% and our expenditures are growing at 3.6% on average, uh, we have nothing left but the tax levy to try and, and fix that. So. We had discussed this to your uh, question, um, uh, Melinda. These were some different ranges that we had put up. And to be honest with you, um, you know, what's the right one? Can't really tell you. Uh, I think that's the conversation we have to have. But if, we're if we were going to ask to go over the tax levy limit, in my opinion, it would be worth trying to get as much as you felt comfortable getting because getting just a little bit more, uh, to me, doesn't fix that, that issue, uh, this gap. So if we're gonna ask, we should probably consider asking for you know, a substantial amount. Now, with that said, how do we engage people, to your point earlier, how do we get people engaged? And how do we ask people, obviously, if they're willing to, to support that? So, um, Here's my first recommendation. There is a tool that is used uh, across New York State. It's called Thought Exchange. And it is a, a tool that allows uh, communities and staff and, and, and people to dialogue and engage around questions. And it's, uh, it's got a fantastic um, uh, analytics. Uh, it's, it's built to disseminate and synthesize information 
in, a, in a way that allows decision makers the ability to, to take data and make decisions. And so Thought Exchange, and I'll just I'll show you this is their this is their company if you've ever seen them, uh, and that's their kind of their mission. Help leaders throughout New York State create meaningful interactive online discussions that deeply engage more people. So in response to COVID-19, Thought Exchange offered up school districts through June 30th a free, uh, free use of their service because their, their thought was this COVID-19 pandemic has created a lot of, of uncertainty and, and, and stress uh, in communities and they wanted to offer up their service. So I reached out to them and I said, okay, so could we use this uh, also to ask our community about our, our financial situation. And so their comment was, absolutely. If you want to use this to ask your, your community if they support, you know, going out over the tax levy, absolutely. But their recommendation was to engage the community in a broader sense first, a, a larger conversation, and then zero in on these are the circumstances, these are the issues we're dealing with, uh, would you support overriding the tax levy? So I met with them today. Uh, I would like to, I will, I will send you the preliminary plan, which is going to be uh, Tuesday. I think we're going to meet. And I would like, uh, I would like us to use this tool to start conversations with our community, not only around COVID-19 and some of the other issues that you know that are noted, but about the financial issues and culminating with, would you support potentially a tax levy override. So if you're comfortable, and again, I know you haven't seen it, you haven't demoed it, and, and I, would, I, would, uh, I would say if you would go on thoughtexchange.com and I'll send you the link, you can check it out. It's a pretty, it's a pretty cool uh, tool. It's used all across New York State. Um, Brighton, City School, or Brighton Central School District in Rochester used it last year when they were trying to override their tax levy limit. They use this as a tool. So. Uh, the superintendent, Kevin McGowan, uh, is someone that, I, that uh, I would be comfortable reaching out with to say, hey, could you help me uh, kind of walk me through what you did when you asked your community? So we have resources. Bottom line, we have resources. We have a potential platform that won't cost us anything. And if you want me to start this process to get feedback from the community, we have the ability to. So, Jason, I, I don't recall that Brighton override there. Did Brighton um, get their over, override their tax levy limit? Were they successful? No, they were not. But there was also rebate checks at the time that right. would have been punitive. Yep. Right. 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 Got it. Uh, is the so is the tool used for sessions or is it available all the time? You know, like so. So, so having. I think from a participation standpoint, you know, having a, a, that, that tool be available over a period of time where you could really, you know, get people to maybe tabulate their support, um, right? I, I know, you know, engaging in conversation is one thing, but we really want to know what the numbers might end up being, right? So, you know, if it's a if it's a one shot, you know, a, I guess maybe a series of sessions. But if it's a one, you know, just like a session or two, like we have, you know, public sessions for the budget, right? You don't get a lot of participation. We haven't classically had a lot of participation. I, I know that it, you get more participation when it's when there's something controversial like where we are today, but, um, you know, that, that would be a question. I know you haven't probably used the tool yourself either, but that would be a question I would ask is, can you, can you have something continuously running? Um, so, you know, we can get an idea of what the support levels would be. So I, I will say this, Greg, I've used it. I haven't used it a lot. I've used it more as a, uh, a participant, not as a host. Uh, what it is, is it's a Google form on serious steroids. You know, Google forms a real simple survey tool. If we want to collect information like, 
do you support the tax levy, yes or no? We could certainly do that. This tool would allow that, but it also it is, it is open. Uh, it, it can be as long as you want it to be, so you can collect as much information from as many people as you want, um, but you can also drill down into specifics. So I think it would do exactly what we want in a more analytical and open uh, dialogue than a simple, do you support yes or no? Yeah, okay. No, but that's that's good. I just Go ahead. I think it, it sounds worthwhile to do because I think it would give us a an idea of what at least maybe the majority or at least a portion of our our community um, feels. But I think if there's a way for us to be really thoughtful in like kind of the campaign that goes around it, and I don't know. I'm I'm looking at Thought Exchange, but I don't know how much they help with that, but um, helping with like a campaign to get people to engage because I think that it's probably true that there's people in our community who are either not comfortable maybe with the, the platform and that technology or are so overwhelmed with other things that they're not going to participate. So I think if we have some input from, from thoughtful people um, about what we say about it to get people to even click on it. And then how do we take into account that there's there might be some people who won't be familiar enough or comfortable with using that as a way to communicate what's happening? Yeah, I think that's a fair question. I, I you know, to your point, uh, we certainly need to engage people. Uh, thought exchange will help. Uh, obviously, we need to craft what we're looking for, but but to your point, Vicki, uh, yeah, I mean, we would have to engage people uh, in multiple ways, although we do still need a central collection depository for the data. Right. Uh, but, but I agree with you. Agree. Is that there something that we could, could, could we do some sort of like phone survey in addition? Or That's not part of the thought exchange process, right? That's simply an online thing? Yeah, this is more of a, um, an online survey that, that engages people to comment on each other's comments. So, I, so we put a central question out, do you support overriding the tax levy? And maybe someone will write, yes, I believe it's the most important thing, education is important. And then the next person can either like that or they can put another comment under it, or they can put a, a comment completely uh, opposed to that. And mm -hmm. it's a running, essentially a running record to get people to see what other people are thinking and saying um, about a central topic. So, but that doesn't mean everyone's going to want to feel comfortable doing that either. To your earlier point, we still have to engage people that aren't comfortable with technology or, or don't feel they have time. Jason, is my mic on now? This is Jamie. Yes. Yeah, oh, okay, good. Good. Yes. Thank you for the uh, screenshot. I imagine that's Tom's work behind the scenes. So that's good. I just wanted to add that I, I think um, Vicki's comment was very thoughtful and kind of where my mind was going to. I have a um, pretty good background in uh, using Thought Exchange in other districts. And they've moved. The, the reason that it seems to that people migrate away is it, it takes quite a while to get that analytical data. Maybe they, you know, would make some kind of a agreement and that could be a bit more time sensitive, but as a broad brush comment, that doesn't come very quickly. And also I, I worry that, um, you know, uh, we would miss a, a significant uh, particular part of our population. I, I uh, you know, you could go to our unions and such, but it's the taxpayers, you know, it's not at that point that would be voting on a budget. Not everybody that works is in the, in the, um, you know, this would be voting on our school budget. They're going to vote on the budget where they live. So I, I, I feel a caution on something all on the input. Um, res isn't very good when you don't have like a, what else has somebody, because I don't know, but I just would want to know 
there was some get that analytical day timely time so, frame. Yeah, I mean, we can put together, if we, we can take this concept, move it aside and say, let's just come up with a simple survey. And it could be, we could broadcast it through all of our media channels, three to five questions. Um, and just, and it could be as simple as a Google form or some other uh, tool to simply collect quick, hard data. Uh, if right. that's the direction you'd, you'd rather go, we could do that fast. And, and I, I support that as well. I'll do whatever you want. Um, to your point, Jamie, this is a, a little longer of a process. It's deeper, but, it, but there's time, time issues to it. Good point. Yeah. Jason, does our media outlets only reach those, though, that um, are, have students in the district right now? So, yeah, yes and no. Um, obviously, like our school messenger calls and our, you know, our district-specific uh, methods, yes. We would probably have to do kind of old school and send out a, a you know, a 13-cent postcard to everyone, uh, to every taxpayer, like we would uh, uh, normal notifications, and ask them to participate. So, yes and no. We, we have the database, but we don't have the ability to send like a, a robocall to all 11,000 taxpayers. Well, and, and my idea of engaging organizations within the, dis within the school's district was not so much for support, although that's definitely something we would want, but, but also to spread the word for all their contacts because, you know, people that, that, you know, that they know, people that we know and say, hey, why don't you go on and, you know, on this uh, website and, you know, express your support or non-support of uh, tax levy increase. It's just to spread the more to spread the word than to, you know, just limit the. Actually, the idea there was to expand the participation through, you know, two people know two other people. Pretty soon, there's four people got the message right. They spread it to two other people, so it's more of a, a kind of a, you know, get the word out more exp, exponentially in that manner. So I got it. Yep, that that makes sense. Right. Jamie, yeah. you, when you used the thought exchange, um, was there a high participation rate? There was a good return, but I, um, I wouldn't say it was a balanced return. People that were connected to the district, there was a good return. People who would not know that, um, there was not. So I don't know if that really answers your question. Um, a good return in the in the population that you would expect, right? And not a, a overall, um, you know. I want to. That that's the best I can. That's the yeah, best. Yeah, sure. Answer. Thanks. Yep. Yeah. No. No form of communication is perfect. And right. no. exactly, that's a good point too. I don't mean that's why I stumbled a little. I didn't want to say that it didn't do its job, but. Because nobody, nothing's probably going to reach him. But we just felt like um, there was uh, groups missing, notice, notable age groups missing. Yeah, and so there's actually there's two communication plans here. We collect the data, you make a decision, and then if the decision is yes, I think we're going to do it. We then have essentially 30 days to educate the voters on why we're doing it. So you know we have kind of there's two pieces to this. And if you're looking for quick data, just something to let you know, do you think people would support this? Then I think using a more simpler uh, tool is probably better. Three to five questions, simple format, yes or no. Yes. Now we have the data. And then, you know, now you at least have something to, to base a, a decision off of. I think that's a really good idea, Jason. Keep it simple. Um, you know, with the three to five questions like that. Um, I, I think like uh, Jamie was saying, if you do the, uh, like, who are you going to get responses for are the people who are, who are generally connected. 
Okay, like you said, when you have school closures and school, you know, delays, all those people generally will respond. It's the group that's going to make the difference in this vote is voters who don't have children in the district. Okay, and they're not, they're kind of like, I want to say outliners, but they're the people that you have to pull because they're going to make the difference. I'll tell you right now, they will make the difference is the people who don't have children in the district. Okay, because they fit, hey, I'm retired, I'm on a tight budget, I really can't afford this. So they're the people who are going to be the key votes. That's just my thinking. And as far as getting everybody involved, um, I, I know one of the things I helped work for was the Dollars for Scholars program, where you just called people up and asked them, you know, for, for money for those uh, types of scholarships for the, for the seniors. And it was a great program and it got good response. I think a lot of people like it. And let's have the students do that. Let's ask the students if they could go and just ask like three simple questions and call people up and just just tally it. And when they make it, I mean, get this, they're the ones who are going to be affected, going to be affected, especially those in, you know, 10th and 11th grade. Okay, they're going to really be affected. And I think they'll, they'll, they'll do it. I mean, they realize how important it's going to be to lose these things that we're talking about if we don't go above the tax levy. Um, and that was just one of my things I talk, thought about. Thanks. Thanks, Pete. Yep. You know, the, there's kind of an interesting to the students now. You know, we want to put a, 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 a continuation online. And, the, you know, again, a broad brush painting now to the families and kids that you'll get and that will are engaging and you get ones that, you know, then there's another batch that I put it that way. So that of a, a, a reversal, um, you can apply that when you put something out, and you know via the via the line. And thought we had all families engaged and and um, on and ready to, to to embrace that. Then you know we might see that even in their in the learning what's going on. I don't know if that's a good parallel or not, but. I always like to think that, of course, everybody would would jump on that. This is this is what we're doing now, and I I don't have the bird's eye view for this district, but I do for another, and it's just not as quite what we, you know, had hoped. Right. So that's just another little. I don't know if that's a good parallel to make or not, as we're trying to decide how to best um, get our elicit our feedback, but. We sort of have that going on right now with um, trying to get kids, get it, get everybody engaged to be in an online platform. Okay, thanks, Jamie. Yeah, it's good. Makes sense. I don't think it's a bad idea if we do the thought exchange because it is. Um, it doesn't cost us anything, and if we can also send something out with you know three a few basic questions to kind of help us reach people who won't go on thought exchange um i'm just kind of suggesting maybe to kind of do both approaches yeah melinda i think we can i i think and i think the first part would be um wanting to engage people around all the issues they're dealing with now and then asking for that that specific data and then circle back with them once we have specific data. So yeah, we can do both. I think that's a great idea. Any other questions on that? So what, I, what I'm thinking is I will create, I'll work with um, our IT department to come up with the, the best um, tool. I'll come up with three to five questions. I will send them to you to have you look at them, and if you feel they're, they're what we're looking for, uh, then we'll work on uh, a dissemination plan and start collecting the data. Yeah, sounds good. Sounds good. Yep. Okay. Great, thank you. Okay. Okay, thank you. Anything, anything we can do to get information. Yep, agreed. Okay. The, uh, the only other recommendations then at this point, um, 
you've seen this before, uh, we do recommend continuing to try to maintain our allowable fund balance uh, as close to 4% as possible. Uh, we also are recommending, and this is official recommendation, uh, official preliminary uh, uh, recommendation, that we should reduce reserve use in anticipation of potential state aid reductions. So that is why you saw the reduction in, in reserve use, uh, because we believe we need to be uh, prepared in the event state aid is reduced. And then my last recommendation, preliminary recommendation, is to continue with the bus uh, purchase agreement plan. Uh, and a question had come from the Board of Education uh, budget uh, email. Uh, uh, community member asked, aren't the real costs of the buses after state aid like 10,000 each, even though you, know, you see 509,000? And the answer is yes. When you factor in state aid uh, and you factor in um, when we sell the, the remaining buses and we get residual value back, when you factor all that in, those $509,000 worth of buses actually cost the district around $12,000 each or roughly $50,000 in real cost to the, to the taxpayer. So uh, I know it's a big number, but it is, um, it is the best return on investment we have. So I'm glad. I want to thank that community member for reaching out and asking that question uh, because that's, that's correct. And, and that information will be coming out in our budget uh, hearing. So I'll stop there. That's it uh, for the Board of Education for all of you. I know we have some questions from community members that have come in. Um, and what I would suggest is that if we have your information uh, or if you want to take your question and email it to that email address, I will respond uh, or we will respond as a, as a district. Uh, so again, if you would take those questions and send them to that email address or if you want to wait and ask it under general comment in the regular meeting, we will answer them then. So I know it's about 7.03. Um, uh, anyone on the board have any questions or can we take uh, about a three minute break and set up for the regular board meeting? Sure. Sure. Why don't we okay. come back at 7.10? Okay, thanks Greg. Okay. Thank you. So are we, we don't have